the creator of the universe. He received the spirit of God, the spirit that unsettles what seems to be forever fixed. The spirit that enlivens what seems to be dead and beyond hope. The spirit that kindles a light where we can only see darkness. The spirit that speaks truth and meaning where we know only chaos and meaninglessness. That spirit and that identity that Jesus received in that moment is also for us. For the last month, we've been hearing all about Jesus, but he himself has been strangely silent. It's uh, December 3rd, actually, the last time we heard a gospel reading here in church in which Jesus actually spoke. It's the longest hiatus like that anywhere in the lectionary as far as I know, and even today. After all these words spoken by John the Baptist, by the prophet Isaiah, by the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary, by the other angels speaking to the shepherds in the fields at night, even today Jesus is still silent, still listening still open to receive the gift, the gift out of which he must soon speak. So we're waiting. What is he going to say? What Will the Spirit give to him to say to us, he who is the beloved Son of God, how will he communicate the love that he has received to you and to me? Well, we're going to have to wait to find out. But come back next week. And in the weeks to follow, see what he does with this gift that he has received. So I also have been silent for a month and more about something that I need to tell uh, all of you, and uh, I'm going to do something I haven't done for a while, and climb up in the pulpit there, because I want to read uh, something to you. This morning, uh, the senior warden at Trinity Episcopal Church in Ashland, Oregon, is announcing to that congregation that their long search for their new rector uh, is over, that I will be coming there beginning on Sunday, March 17th my final day here at St. John's will be Sunday, March 3rd. And my heart is full as I say these words to you. But 
foremost among many feelings swirling within me this morning is gratitude. Serving as your rector has been the greatest honor and privilege of my vocational life. And I am deeply thankful to God for blessing our ministry together. This place, this room, this corner, this town, this congregation is where I have learned most of what I know about how to be a priest and what it really means to preach and teach and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. The people of St. John's, young and old, rich and poor, those still living and those now dancing in the company of the ancestor saints have been my teachers. In 2010, Bishop Barry Beisner appointed me as priest in charge on a one-year renewable contract with fingers crossed, hoping that I and the parish were going to make it. Over 13 years later, St. John's is very much alive. During that time, through generosity, courage, and devotion, we have transformed this physical place with six major capital projects, renovating Cram Hall, building the new courtyard and columbarium, constructing ADA access to the church and offices and the hill terrace, restoring the altar window, replacing the organ console, and now restoring and replacing the sanctuary roof, as well as many minor repairs, upgrades, and improvements. We've also repaired the reputation of St. John's Episcopal Church in this community, once known as an insular church at war with itself, over policing other people's sexuality and gender expression. Petaluma now knows us as a warm and open-hearted congregation with a vibrant and inclusive spirituality and commitment to the arts, to interfaith solidarity, to works of mercy, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, sheltering the homeless, and welcoming the stranger. Most important is the repair work God is doing in our hearts, transforming St. John's into a spiritually and emotionally safe and healthy place for everyone. We have learned that the Christian life really is as simple as loving one another. Which doesn't mean we are perfect, don't make mistakes, or never disagree. But that we have come to trust that in every person's heart, including our own, the light of Christ is present. What I see when I come to church on Sunday or any other time is people encouraging one another with kindness, vulnerability, and affection to let that light shine. This gives me great hope, not just for St. John's, but for the whole church. While it grieves me to leave you, I will carry you with me as a sign of hope for what God's grace and love can do. 
I trust that this grace and love will be sufficient to guide you into the next phase of the long and storied history of this parish. Indeed, I feel excited and happy and even a little bit envious of the person who will have the honor and privilege of serving as your new rector. No doubt you will continue to face the challenges that confront churches everywhere, same ones, incidentally, that Trinity Ashland faces. But you have already in your midst the gifts to meet the future toward which Christ now calls you, offering your next rector a golden opportunity to grow with you as I have grown in the love of God and neighbor. I ask you to pray now and continually for your vestry, who will have the responsibility of guiding the parish through this upcoming transition. They will be supported in this task by our bishop and our diocese, in particular the canon to the ordinary and transition minister, the Reverend Julie Wakeley, who I've known since seminary and have great confidence in, a person of great faithfulness, good sense, and pastoral wisdom. She will be meeting with the vestry on January 23rd to begin equipping them for this process and will coach them through it to a successful completion. The next two months will pass in the blink of an eye. So if there's anything any of you wish to say to me in private before my departure, I would encourage you to contact me without delay so that we can schedule that conversation. Finally, I hope that you will all join me and my family and anyone else you care to invite in Cram Hall after church on Sunday, March 3rd for a farewell brunch. Eternally yours in Christ. So um, there are a bunch of copies of this letter um, actually over on the copy machine next door because I sort of ran out of time this morning. So at some point before the end of the service, if somebody could run over and grab those, um, so that we'll have them at the back of the church if any of you wish to take a copy with you when you leave today. Um, and I'll be sending it out via email to everybody who couldn't be here today later on. Out of the silence, a voice speaks. Out of the darkness, a light shines. And the voice does not drown out the darkness. And the light does not consume, I mean, the voice does not drown out the silence. And the darkness does not consume the light. God created light and dark together. Morning and evening first day, coming and going, meeting and parting, grieving and rejoicing are all bound up together in the amazing gift that is the world God has created. the world we inhabit. And these 
are within us. Right alongside our sense of frailty and limitation. Our inability to halt the passage of time. The flux and change that are continual. Right alongside those, God continually recreates and renews the universe. Just as God's Spirit recreates and renews our own lives. 